Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining our breakout panel on restorative justice. My name is Adele Fontenet and I'm gonna be the moderator of today's panel. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to let everyone know the general format of today's panel. Um, we're gonna start with introductions, get to know each other a little bit. Um, then we're gonna give a quick overview on some of the overarching principles of restorative justice. And then we're gonna get right into the heart of it. And we're gonna ask our panelists to talk about the wonderful and transformative work they're doing in their restorative justice programs. So um, as I mentioned earlier, my name is Adele Fontenet and I'm the director of the Tribal Justice Exchange here at the Center for Court Innovation. Um, I work to provide technical assistance to tribal justice systems all across the United States, doing things like needs assessment, strategic planning, and implementing um, innovative and problem solving practices like alternatives to incarceration and so on and so forth. But I actually got my start here at the center in the Red Hook Peacemaking Program, um, doing peacemaking. And one of our panelists is gonna talk a lot more about that program later. So let's turn it over to our panelists. Um, I'm gonna ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves, tell us your name, your role, what jurisdiction you come from. And then I'm gonna ask you to share, what does restorative justice mean to you? So let's start with Judge Evans, Chief Judge. My name is Timothy Evans. I am the Chief Judge of the Circuit Court of Cook County. I have been a judge for the last 28 years and I've been Chief Judge for the last 19 years. And um, here in Cook County, we have established three restorative justice courts. One is on the west side of the city of Chicago, and it's called the North Lawndale Restorative Justice Court. One is on the south side of the city of Chicago, and it's called the Inglewood Restorative Justice Court. And one is on the north side of the city of Chicago, and it is called the Avondale Restorative Justice Court. And for me, the, the emphasis of restorative justice means a second chance for the young people who we are urging to become a part of our court. And in Cook County, the young people that we encourage are those within the ages of 18 and 26. We consider them to be emerging adults. And before this uh, webinar is over, I'll talk to you a little bit more about why I consider them to be emerging adults. Thank you so much, Chief Judge. We look forward to hearing a lot more about that later. Right. Um, next, could we move to Ron? Please introduce yourself. Tell us about your program, what jurisdiction you're in, and what does restorative justice mean to you? Thank you. Uh, my name is Ron Johnson. I'm the coordinator of the Dane County Community Restorative Court. And like the judge said, um, oh, it's about second chances. Um, when, uh, when we like to say that our program is victim-based, um, respondent focused, respondent is a uh, offender and community driven. So that when a crime is committed, it, 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 it's not only a crime against the state, but it's harm done to communities and relationships of people in communities. So we work with community, they're called, they're volunteers called peacemakers, and depending on the county or the jurisdiction that we are from, we work with volunteers, citizens from that community, as well as victims and respondents to resolve issues and to restore the, um, um, restore the harm that has been done. We work with misdemeanors and, and we work with um, uh, um, um, misdemeanors and, and um, municipals. We work with young people, 17 to 25, and I'm not sure what district that is, but it is Dane County part of, part of uh, the city of Madison. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, Amanda, we're gonna jump to you now. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amanda Berman. I am the project director at the Red Hook Community Justice Center, which is a community court that operates as a partnership between the Center for Court Innovation and the New York State Court System. And at the Justice Center, we utilize restorative practices in a number of different ways and in different programs, most notably our peacemaking program, which I'll be talking a little bit about today. 
And to me, restorative justice at its core is about community. It's about recognizing that we're all connected to one another and that when harm is caused, it impacts those connections. And it's about allowing us to look at harm as it impacts people, as opposed to just a law or a code that's been violated. And then it allows us to respond in kind by rebuilding people and rebuilding those connections to strengthen one another and our communities. Thank you so much. So now I guess I'm gonna step back and ask each of you, could you tell me a little bit about the origin stories? How did your programs get started? What was the impetus? Was there a moment or a movement or an incident that people really circled around that um, brought to light the conversation of utilizing restorative justice instead of other justice approaches? And again, let's start with you, Chief Judge. In our case here in Cook County, we saw what community courts could do in New York. Um, I visited uh, several meetings coordinated by the Center for Court Innovations there in New York. Uh, they had additional meetings across the country. One I recall quite clearly was in uh, California. And I heard others talking about what community courts could do. Here in Cook County, we have about 400 judges. And we have traditionally assumed that we could help young people by correcting them in some kind of way. They would be arrested, they would be prosecuted, they'd be convicted, they'd often be sent away to a department of uh, corrections. But we noticed here in Cook County that punishment did not stop the crime. Frequently, these young people would go away to the Department of Corrections and they'd come back better criminals. They would talk to hardened criminals down there who, who would find out what they did wrong in terms of getting caught. And they would come back uh, committing more crime in the community that got them into trouble in the first place. And so we decided, no, punishment is not the key, healing is the key. And that's what this is all about. As someone has already said, these young people, in my case, we're talking about those between the ages of 18 and, and 26, uh, many of them have been in the juvenile system <clears throat> and uh, they are on their way to an adult system if somebody doesn't step in to let them see what harm their activities have caused. Let them see what needs to be done to make the victims of their harm whole. Let them see what remorse is really like so that they become uh, remorseful and they empathize with the young, with the other people, and frequently as somebody of a similar age <clears throat> that they have harmed. But the key then is to embrace the concept of repairing the harm that they have caused. And we invite the community to help us <clears throat> establish what that repair of harm should be. Generally speaking, the community consists of the people who watch this young person grow up. They know that young person and they know the victim. And frequently their teachers are involved or it might be a police officer involved or it might be a community leader involved, and they decide what it is that would repair the harm. It might be an apology. It might be community service. It might be restitution of some kind. Thank you so much, Chief Judge. I'm going to hand it off to you now, Ron. Could you tell us a little bit about how your program got started? Right. Um, I'm a transplant from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I am um, a former teacher and principal and um, and I worked for a number of years, for about 10 years at Marquette University Law School, where I learned restorative justice from um, an international teacher of restorative justice, um, Janine Geske. And so I moved to Madison to help them start the restorative justice program. After um, 
Dane County has a dubious distinction of being of, of uh, one of the um, leading communities in the nation in terms of racial disparities of uh, people of color and in, 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 in the criminal justice system, specifically black men being incarcerated. So we wanted to create a program that indeed gave um, second chances and allowed, allowed the community to be involved. This is a very progressive community and a lot of people that want to be involved in the criminal justice system and, and have the desire to, um, to be a part of making their communities a better place um, to live. So um, um, like in Chicago, we recognize that we work with young people 17 to 25, and a lot of crimes are committed with that age group. Now we know all, all the science says that the, that the um, um, human brain isn't fully developed until after, at least at, at least after age um, 25. And we wanted to make an impact on people who made mistakes, who made errors in judgment. Uh, we work with municipals and misdemeanors. We have worked with a number of um, felonies and, and um, very su um, successful. So we work with um, <clears throat> um, um, with the district uh, with the district attorney. We receive referrals from the DA and we receive referrals from law enforcement. Um, Dane County has something like 21 municipalities, and each one has a um, is a, a police district. So we have um, memorandums of understanding with 16 of the of the 21 some odd um, communities and, and police districts in in uh, Madison. My staff and I have went out and personally trained every single police officer in in Madison in the city of Madison and in most of the jurisdictions that we have MOUs, because we wanted to give the police officer on the beat the opportunity and the power, if you will, to um, engage young people who are making these mistakes and, and going to jail. Now, we don't work with violent crimes. We don't work with um, DVs. We don't work with sexual or, or uh, drug cases. We work with a specific number of cases, <clears throat> and we, um, we work to resolve them restoratively through um, community service, uh, and I might add that during the during the COVID situation, community service is is much lessened. So we are challenged to come up with alternative ways of uh, sanctions to to work programs out. Because of course, with the COVID, we we we, we are, are reluctant to have people do community service. So we do things like um, um, uh, letters of apology, and we don't, by the way, impose apologies if the respondent doesn't um, come up with the apology, we would never ask a person to write a letter of apology because that it would be inauthentic. Um, but we do um, a reflection letters. We, we, I had a young man once who was a, um, uh, he was a, um, um, an actor at the, at the UW, we're, we're a college town. And uh, his, his repair harm agreement was to um, write um, a song and talk about what happened that night and he his song was something like I don't know what happened that night I know I wasn't thinking right <laughs> and it, it was a song and do so the idea is that we allow the victim to be a part of the discussion from the beginning because in the traditional system judge you, you can attest very often the victim doesn't have a meaningful significant role so we allow the victim to be up front we allow the victim and the and the um, respondent to be in a safe place where they can where they can express themselves and talk about uh, what happened. And the community is involved through the peacemakers. So we have to come to a consensus, not just a majority, but a consensus, a, a consensus of an understanding of what happened. When we do circles, we first do a pre-conference, it's called an intake, where we sit down and we talk about not only the incident of what happened, but the makeup of the person the circumstances and situations around what happened. Very often, the story behind the, the um, police report is very different than what it, um, originally um, comes to us. So we try to value the person and we look at not just the law, but we look at the people involved and the harm that is done to people and how we can repair the harm. We have a 90% success rate in uh, Dan County. 
which means that once a repair harm agreement, which is the contract between the respondent and the circle, one, once that is completed, we consider that um, um, a successful case. And then um, like in Chicago, the charges are dropped. Actually, the charges are, are never, we are a pre-charge diversion program. So when a, um, when a charge is issued, it is never actually applied, it's held in abeyance. Thank you so much, Ron. That was really comprehensive and thorough, um, but you opened up a lot of fun things that I think we're gonna try to dig into a little bit later. Okay. Before we get to that, I'm gonna pass it off to Amanda. So in Red Hook, we were very fortunate to have benefited from the work of our colleagues from the Center for Court Innovations Tribal Justice Exchange, which you heard about earlier in Adele's introduction. Um, and those staff members were providing technical assistance to Native American communities, while at the same time learning about Native practices that could potentially enhance our work in state court settings. And so it became apparent that the peacemaking process um, was something that was very different from what was practiced in state courts um, and that could achieve results that our Western court system really couldn't, largely because our courts here um, in typically in state court, um, in Western traditional courts, our courts approach is typically if there is a conflict or a wrongdoing, we separate and we isolate. We isolate the victim, we isolate the defendant. There's orders of protection that are handed down. People are removed from their communities, from their families, from their homes, and there's no opportunity for healing or reparation. And so peacemaking does just the opposite. And so the planning team, uh, led by some of our other colleagues from the Center for Court Innovation, undertook a process over the course of many months to learn very deeply about the history and practice of peacemaking and to explore whether it could be implemented in a non-tribal court setting. And this was done um, with guidance and training and mentorship of our partners from the Navajo Nation. Um, and ultimately they chose the Red Hook Community Justice Center as the pilot site. And so the Red Hook Peacemaking Program was born. You know, um, Adele, I might add that we too visited New York. We visited Red Hook met, and met the incredible judge, um, Calabrese. And we actually developed our Peacemaker Program, got the name from uh, from Red Hook, so thank you. And, and in terms of uh, tribal involvement, over the course of the six years, we have invited two tribal judges to come to Madison to, because we felt that it was um, maybe sometimes inappropriate to use tribal healing practices without conferring and consulting with, um, with the uh, first world. So we benefited greatly from the wisdom of, of the tribal judges. Yeah, I appreciate all of you acknowledging that restorative justice has its roots in indigenous practices for Absolutely. many uh, communities and indigenous peoples across the world. Um, yes. And it is something that we are just now beginning to integrate into our justice systems yes. um, thousands of years later. <laughs> um, but speaking of, so, so many good things were said um, and we started to get sort of into the nuts and the bolts and the heart of how the work it plays out in our different uh, programs and practices. Um, but maybe just as a quick, uh, to zoom back for some of the folks who are watching this, who are maybe just learning about restorative justice for the first time are interested in learning more about circles, but they don't, they've never seen one or they don't understand how it works. Um, maybe it might be helpful to give a little bit of a background as to what, what a case looks like. Um, who's involved? What's this repair harm agreement? Who are peacemakers? Who, who, who's sitting at the table? What's happening? Um, I, I feel like sometimes there's a little bit of, of magic or mystery around the conversation of circles and how they play out. So I'm wondering if um, each of you might be able to shed a little bit of light into how you're like what a case looks like when it comes through your justice system. Um, let's start with you again, Chief Judge. All right, uh, in Cook County, typically a case starts with uh, an arrest by the police department uh, in the Chicagoland area. Uh, the case then is referred to the state's attorney 
and uh, uh, normally the state's attorney can confer with whoever is going to represent the person who has been charged with the misdemeanor or the, uh, the felony. And um, we also involve, uh, as, as Ron said, the victim uh, of the crime to see if the victim is willing to participate in um, this circle process. And we see if the community has been hurt by the conduct that this particular participant, I'll call him for our purposes today to defend that, um, has engaged in. And once we find that everyone is willing to cooperate and participate, we then embrace the circle process. And for us, we have circle keepers and we have case workers. The, we typically have the circle, which is literally a circle uh, composed of the victim, the participant, the, the community residents, uh, sometimes the, the prosecutor, sometimes the police officer who conducted the arrest. Uh, and they literally sit in a circle. Everything said in the circle is confidential so that uh, we don't want the victim to hesitate in telling the perpetrator what happened and how it impacted the victim. For example, if the uh, participant, let's say, burglarized the victim's home and took uh, the computer away, well, that computer might have been the main source of income for the victim. The, particularly during the coronavirus period, a lot of people are working from home. And if you take their computer away, they don't have any way to conduct their business. So the circle is designed to let the perpetrator know how it feel, felt to have somebody break in the back door or break in the front door, uh, to have somebody take their prized possession, the thing that helped them to work and survive. And uh, so the circle provides that opportunity. But in addition, the circle is also designed to give the perpetrator an opportunity to be heard. For example, um, a perpetrator might be asked, well, why, why did you do, do this? And the perpetrator might say, well, I have children, I don't have a job, I knew the computer was in there, I didn't know anybody was going to be there, but I hope to steal the computer, sell the computer, and then I could buy my family what our family needed. Uh, and, and while that doesn't excuse the, the criminal conduct, at least the victim has a chance to hear what the perpetrator was thinking at the time that the perpetrator did what was done. And um, also sometimes the perpetrator does it because he's hooked on drugs and he wants to sell the computer to buy other drugs. Well, when the community in that circle hears that, they say, oh, we know one of the elements in your repair of harm, yes, we're going to have to uh, get the victim another computer. We'll get you a job in the community and your first check is going to be used to buy that victim another computer. But also, we want you to work in the community, the community and sign up for drug rehabilitation. And uh, so, but also, let me just rush to say, the circle is designed to make certain that the perpetrator never commits that kind of activity again against this victim or any other victim. So it's designed to stop that conduct, but also to help the perpetrator develop into a better person, a better citizen with um, uh, maybe choices that he didn't have before. Cognitive behavioral therapy designed to help him consider the consequences of his action. Thank you, that was very helpful. Ron. Yes, let me start off with peacemakers because peacemakers are the backbone of our program. They represent the community. 
I put a lot of time, especially in, in the early days of um, recruiting peacemakers, who are everyday Dan County citizens, um, who come to um, the program with a great deal of experience and background and know-how. Many of them are retired citizens, many of them are active. We've actually trained about four active police officers as peacemakers. So we have, we're college town. So we have a professor, John Shar, who is, um, our trainer and our peacemakers go through 16 hours of training um, can, um, presented by the university. And it's a uh, 16 hours over, over two weeks. We feed them and we, it's very interactive. It's entertaining. Sometimes it's funny, um, but we do a lot of role playing and we try to present real life situations. So um, peacemakers are an integral part of what we do. And, you know, we do a pre-circle because I don't like surprises when it comes to a circle. So you try to make sure if the respondent, and, and I'm sorry, Judge, but we don't use words like perpetrator. <laughs> and I know that's a legal term, but we try to give the person a positive experience with um, the criminal justice system, which for many of our clients, they never have a positive experience with the police or the criminal justice system. So how we treat them, how we talk to them, what we call them, um, their experience from the very beginning is very, very important. We try to treat them with dignity, with dignity and respect, and I'm sure that you do as well. So um, we um, are trying to give them in a circle. It's a safe place. It's confidential as is, is as it is in Chicago, and we try to um, make sure that the circle is a safe place, and and that it's um, and that it's confidential, and that people feel free to open up and express themselves. Amanda, would you be able to tell us, is your process similar? Is it different? Yeah, I would say that our peacemaking program um, bears a lot of similarities um, to what you both described. Um, when the program was first launched, it was primarily serving as a pre-plea court-based diversion program. And so the way that we would get cases was that if all of the parties consented, so that would mean the person who's been harmed, you know, the complaining witness or the victim, and then the defendant, and of course the prosecutor and defense counsel, and ultimately the judge, if everybody agreed, then the case would be referred to our program at some point after the criminal court arraignment um, and without any plea being entered. And this was really important because voluntariness is really critical to, um, to the model of restorative justice. And so we didn't want peacemaking to be seen as some kind of mandate as many diversion programs in the criminal court context often are. So there was no plea involved. Um, and that's still how we operate to this day. I'd say the biggest area we've expanded is that now we also get referrals from all of these other sources, from schools, from um, directly from the police pre-arrest, from our uh, partner CBOs um, and other entities that allow us to intervene even earlier in the court process. But either way, once the conflict or case comes to us, the way we handle it pulls directly from the Navajo model of peacemaking um, with a few differences where we needed to adapt. Um, but the circle includes the parties who are directly involved and then they're permitted to bring in support people as well. Um, and so that might be someone from their family, a friend. Um, if it's a victim who's working with our on-site victim services program, they might bring their um, the case manager um, or social worker who they're working with, anyone who may them feel safe in that space. Yeah. Um, and then we have a staff member from our peacemaking program and the peacemakers. We usually have at least two peacemakers. Um, and, you know, as Ron said, they really are the backbone of the program. They represent the community. Um, we train a new class every year. Um, we have a little over 200 people trained at this point who come from all walks of life you know, high school students, members of the clergy, former participants, police officers, um, they all bring a different perspective. And that's really important because it allows our team to really be thoughtful about which peacemakers they're assigning to which conflict. And so they try to identify peacemakers 
who might have had relevant life experience and who can tell their stories in the circles so that that can be a point of, you know, of learning and exploring um, and sharing. And, um, and that's really important to the healing process. So the peacemakers are a critical part. Um, and then we serve food. Um, we serve a meal at every session. Um, and that, that tradition of breaking bread came directly from the Navajo tradition to create this sense of a shared experience and community. Um, and we also use a talking piece, as Chief Judge Evans um, mentioned, they, they use that talking piece to ensure that only one person is speaking at a time, no one's talking over one another. So we do the same. And then what happens in between the sessions is that the work is continuing to be done. And so, you know, the person who caused harm is, is working toward accountability and reparation. Um, and they're taking steps outside of the sessions themselves. And those healing steps are typically agreed to during the sessions themselves. So, um, they will be ideas that come from the defendant or from the person who's caused harm. And there's a consensus amongst everyone that yes, those are steps that should be taken. And sometimes they're focused on direct reparations and healing that relationship. And sometimes they're focused on, on healing themselves and kind of you know, addressing the issues that brought them there, um, the issues that may have led to the conflict or that are preventing them from moving forward in their lives. Um, and so those healing steps are really important and our staff um, and the peacemakers support the participants through those steps. Um, and you know, like the other peacemaking programs that were just described, everything that happens in the circle is confidential. So the way we handle that in terms of reporting back to the court is that when there is um, a compliance date, our staff will report back whether the participant has been compliant or not. Um, but those updates don't include details about what's taking place in the sessions. Everyone has agreed in advance that that is confidential. And then when all of the parties who are involved in the circle um, come to an agreement that the process is ready to conclude, and that could be after two sessions, it could be after 10 sessions, every case is different, um, there'll be a final court appearance where the DA will typically dismiss the case. Um, occasionally, they might offer an adjournment in contemplation of dismissal, which for us is sort of a deferred dismissal um, after a number of months. But the idea is at that point, the person's not going to have a record, um, the case is closed, and hopefully it is dismissed and sealed. Thank you, Amanda. And thank you for that walkthrough. I think that was very clarifying. And it's interesting to hear how, even though each of you is doing a circle restorative justice program, how there are already differences in how you approach it, even though you integrate the overarching concepts of restorative justice within the work that you do, but even how you work with slightly different populations at different points in the justice system, you may pull different people into the circle or have different partners. Um, but it sounds like the backbone, really the heart of the work in circles is having peacemakers or circle keepers or community members. So I'm wondering if you guys can talk a little bit about how do you find community members? How do you engage them? And how do you support them in this work and show appreciation for the hard work that they're giving um, by being part of these circles? So I'm thinking let's switch up the order a little bit. Could we start with you, Ron? Okay, wherever, whenever I go to meetings or uh, appearances or uh, engagements, I'm always looking for peacemakers. I've always got a bunch of cards and I'm searching uh, for peacemakers. I often say that we are, our program is 60% case management and 40% collaborative building. And collaborative building in includes working closely with the police department, engaging community, clergy, and so on and so forth, and working with uh, peacemakers. So um, we sometimes, um, we have contemplated giving stipends to peacemakers, and then we, we declined that idea because when money is involved, that simply changes everything. And we've trained over 500 peacemakers in the six years um, that I've been here. We, we do four uh, peacemaker trainings per year, again, conducted by the University of Wisconsin uh, Law School. And, I, and our staff um, is involved. 
at the trainings, we bring in a respondent to give a testimony. Um, we bring in veteran peacemakers to talk about their experiences. So we, um, we give our peacemakers um, a lot of support and we um, view them as, uh, um, as experts in life. And um, so um, I guess I, I can't say enough about the peacemaker experience. Yes, I, I, would, I would certainly agree with uh, what Ron has described. Um, we follow the same process. Uh, many of the uh, circle are trained by a bevy of people here in the Chicagoland area. University of Illinois and the John Marshall Law School does some of the training and they get yeah. their training certificates from the University of Illinois, John Marshall. But uh, we get training from the practitioners, the ones who are in the community who literally do that on a day by day basis. We also um, uh, sent uh, our, our circle keepers up to New York to see what was going on in, in wow. Rook so that they, they would see the way we do it and compare it to the way Red Hook does it. One, one major change we have uh, embraced in Cook County, um, I have found it to be necessary because uh, I want the continuity of the space and the commitment. Initially, when we started uh, our first uh, restorative justice court in North Lawndale, which is the west side of Chicago, the case workers and the circle keepers were, if there was to be any kind of um, compensation at all, they received compensation from the local com community Ilimasinari organization. Uh, but I have found while that system seems to work most of the time, uh, since this is court, I can't depend on uh, the lines of communication remaining open between whoever happens to be the circle keeper and the Ely Masonary charitable organization. And we, we've had a situation where uh, some kind of conflict arose between the circle keeper working for the charitable organization and the charitable organization itself. And so the circle keeper said, well, if I'm not gonna get paid by the charitable uh, organization, then I won't report to the court and things of that kind. So um, a new innovation that um, uh, I have embraced here in Cook County uh, for the first time, uh, I will be paying the circle keepers a stipend and they will literally be employees of the circuit court of Cook County so that they will not only have a salary, they'll have um, insurance benefits, medical, dental, all of that. And uh, I'll say one additional thing, um, and it, it goes back to a history here in Cook County, about 101 years ago uh, here in Cook County, we realized that these uh, young people were not young adults that just because they were young didn't mean that they should know what adults know. And so we established for the first time a juvenile court here in Cook County. And initially that wasn't embraced right away, but not long after that, uh, we got juvenile courts throughout the state of Illinois and then juvenile courts throughout the country and all of the states of the United States. And now throughout the world, everybody can see the value of trying to give these juveniles a second chance. And while I appreciate that, the fact of the matter is that we have more science now than they had a hundred years ago. And it's not just that they're juveniles, but the problem is that the people we want to help don't have the prefrontal cortex developed. And that's the part of the brain that makes the decisions, logical decisions. And they don't get that until they're 25 or 26. And so that's another reason why we approach this the way we do, to try to give them resources while they're in the circle that can substitute 
for them not having that part of the brain that would ordinarily help them to make logical decisions. Like cognitive behavioral therapy is, a, is an example of it. They can then see what the consequences are. We realize that we have to help these young people, even though they don't have this prefrontal cortex. And, and, and the last part of the science I'll mention, I don't want to bore everybody to death, but without the prefrontal cortex, they react using the amygdala. And that's that part of the brain that most people know as fight or flight. It's really freeze, flight, fight or flight. And that's what causes so many people, like the example Ron gave, some young people sitting in a, in a, in a bar talking. They misunderstand some of the language. They misunderstand some of the activity. They, they are easily threatened. Uh, and so we, we've had cases where somebody's at the baseball game and sitting next to somebody and the person who's at the baseball game gets up to buy a hot dog and he steps on somebody's new shoes. Well, the person who owns the new shoes thinks that's a threat. They, they, they react as if this was intentional and they might take out a gun and shoot somebody or they might take out a knife and stab somebody. So, so that's what we are trying to do here. It's, it's more than just trying to help people who need help, but we recognize the science is there now and we have to help them as a society if we want them to do better. And I think all of us want them to do better. Yeah, thank you, Judge, for, for sharing. Sharing with us about the science and emerging adults. Yeah. Um, there is a lot there and there's a lot that the justice system needs to wrap its head around when it comes to dealing with that population. And also thank you for sharing about the work that you are doing to honor and support your peacemakers. That's really incredible work. Um, Amanda, I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about what do you do to sort of nurture your relationships with community members, build peacemakers and, and work to honor and support them in the work they do? Sure. So um, in the early days um, of the program, before I actually came to Red Hook, um, you know, the stories that I hear are about how the team was pounding the pavement, trying to spread the gospel of peacemaking, going to every community meeting, event, yeah, tenant yeah. association meeting, precinct council meeting, any meeting they could get to to try to identify community leaders, you know, who are the people who could step up and, and be these peacemakers. Um, and what happened within a few years was that word got out about this program and the dynamic completely flipped. And now we're at the point where people come to us and say, can I be trained as a peacemaker? And unfortunately, we never have enough funding to run enough trainings to train everyone. So we end up with a wait list, which I, I suppose is a good problem to have, but you know, always on the hunt for more funds so that we can train even more people. And so our training takes takes um, place over the course of about three months for a total of about 25, 30 hours of training. So it's a big commitment. And, and that's the other thing we look for when we're recruiting because we wanna make sure people know in advance what they're committing to. The training is significant. And then once you've been trained, the expectation is that you're, you know, you're, you're participating in circles um, and that you're gonna be a resource to the community. Um, so those trainings, um, you know, take place over the course of, several weeks and they include everything from the history of peacemaking and native practices and culture to the justice system and the history of the justice system, trauma, storytelling, self-care, um, that's all really important. And the trainings are facilitated by um, a variety of folks. Um, we always include our Native American mentors. Um, you know, we, we fly them in, they're a part, they're a critical part of the training um, we have practitioners um, of restorative justice, um, people who are experts in the field. We have um, some of our staff, former um, peacemakers or former participants and experienced peacemakers. Um, you know, each session's a little bit different. And then once they're engaged, um, it is a lot of work to make sure that they're continuing to um, stay engaged, feel appreciated. Um, we offer ongoing trainings um, this fall, um, what we're doing is a remote kind of advanced series of advanced trainings for peacemakers. Um, 
and we do appreciation events. We invite them back for each cohort's graduation. So we always have a nice graduation ceremony and oftentimes existing peacemakers who've been around for a while will come to support the next generation. Um, we had a reunion in the park um, a couple of months ago, a meetup for folks to just reconnect. Um, we also do offer stipends um, and obviously nothing close to a salary, but it is something that we try to do to make sure people feel appreciated. Um, and, you know, we know that when they're giving their time um, that although they're doing it because this is this is work they feel passionate about and love, we also recognize that that they are giving something of themselves, not just their time, but it's a piece of themselves. Um, it's it's a piece of their heart, um, a piece of their you know emotional capacity. And so we do try to recognize that through a small stipend and, and a lot of gratitude. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing all of those good ideas and, and ways that you engage your peacemakers and continue to support them. Um, because yeah, they are the heart of the program, but like we've all acknowledged they're giving a lot of themselves emotionally in time. Um, so it's, it's wonderful to think of all of the different creative ways um, you've found to really engage them and let them know how much this work um, matters. Um, so We've spent a bit of time talking about peacemakers because they are such a big part of the program, but no program ever really happens in a vacuum. So um, I'm wondering, can you guys tell me a little bit about who are the other partnerships that you've had to build or you really had to rely on to make your program successful? Let's start again with you, Ron. Well, um, Dane County has a strong actually um, governmental system, but we've been able to forge alliances with various um, elements of government. And you know, that's not always easy for the district attorney and the police department, the judicial system and the politicals, elected officials working um, together because our goal is really not merely to prevent crime, but to actually change paradigms and thinking. The way that we administer justice, the way that we look at crime, the way that we look at redemption, restora um, 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 uh, uh, restoration of, um, of, of harm. Um, we work with um, churches in the community. We work with the Urban League. Um, we're a college town, so the university plays a big role in what we do, as well as the um, technical um, colleges. And there are programs like um, that work with young people to um, who have dropped out of school or who are struggling in school to get them reengaged. So again, I said about 60% of what we do is, is case management and the rest is um, collaborative building. So we have a strong network of social services because we wanna hold people accountable for the mistakes and the errors in thinking that they did. But we also wanna be able to provide a comprehensive set of community services to help a person not um, reoffend. It's it's about relationship building. So in a circle, we try to build relationships. Every um, respondent in a circle, most of the time I should say, is assigned one of the peacemakers as a mentor to help the person work through the repair harm agreement, make sure they make appointments, make sure they remember to cross the T's and dot the I's. So um, um, teamwork makes the dream work. And we work hard to, to um, work with collaboration, collaboratively with the community. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Could we actually move to Amanda? Like I said, let's switch the order up a little. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I mean, I, I also agree the various justice system stakeholders are really important to this program. Um, you know, the judge, our judge, we're fortunate. Um, we have Judge Calabrese, who um, everybody knows and adores. Um, and, and he, I, I think he has put so much trust in this program and in our community that that has been critical to its success. And the same is true for the prosecutors in Red Hook, the defense bar. Um, because we realized that without having their trust, the program just wouldn't work. You know, right. we are essentially asking for the court or for any system actor to turn their 
powers over, to turn the case over to the community and just commit to this process almost blindly and just say, you know, yeah, we'll honor and respect whatever outcome you come up with. And that I, I understand, especially because I've worked in the court system for many years, that that's a big ask. And um, once the process started and they started to hear from peacemakers and they started to see the outcomes, then it became really clear to them that this was a program worth investing in. And at the conclusion of our peacemaking process, the participants write what we call a consensus decision, which is a statement about what they've learned from the process, how they've grown, where they are now, what they've taken away from it. Um, and when those statements are submitted to the court, um, to the court parties, you, you see from them an acknowledgement, you see from the, you know, all of the court players an acknowledgement of, of the power of this process, an acknowledgement that that really without peacemaking, we never could have gotten here. There's, there's no alternative that exists in our traditional courts that could have gotten us to this point. Um, so, so getting their trust is really important. And I think that's also true of a lot of our, you know, our partners outside of the courthouse too. We, we rely on the police department. We, we want referrals from them. We want them to send us cases instead of making an arrest when they can. Um, we've even been able to train officers, which was, you know, which was a huge, huge development in the program. Um, and we also get a lot of referrals from schools and have done, you know, a ton of work in trying to create alternative forms of school discipline so that we could bring down suspension rates um, and interrupt the school to prison pipeline. So schools locally have been a really important partner for us. Um, and then, you know, just all of our other on-site programs, you know, we have a number of different services that we offer under the umbrella of the Center for Court Innovation in Red Hook. And we have a lot of referrals that come through those channels, the Housing Resource Center or our Victim Services Program. Um, and they're identifying opportunities, you know, for peacemaking to play a role in healing as well. So, so it's both like in-house and then, you know, the, the community more broadly. Thank you. Um, Chief Judge. We have um, great participation right now involving um, the court, our relationship with the state's attorney's office, with the public defender's office, or our private uh, attorneys who represent the participants. Uh, we have a good working relationship with the clerk of the Circuit Court of Cook County because they have to keep all the records. And likewise, we work with the sheriff of Cook County uh, to make sure that uh, they can make they can make sure this is a peaceful atmosphere. But our, our biggest problem was, and it's still a problem. We're still in the process of working on it. Is breaking down these suspicions in the community itself, for the reason that Amanda mentioned. People see the government as somehow contributing to that pipeline between uh, the school and jail, uh, uh, between the school and a, a correctional center somewhere. So we have to break down that resistance. They never heard of restorative justice court. This is something entirely new. And, and their first reaction is somewhat suspicion. You know, oh, what, what is this? Is this gonna be an easier way to prosecute my son? We say, no. This is an easier way to stop your son's conduct and to keep your son in the community. When they see that, they say, oh, you're here to help my son instead of to hurt my son. So we're, I wish I could tell you that all over the city of Chicago, everybody knows about restorative justice, but no, that we are, we are breaking down this resistance wherever we go. Mm -hmm. Who's help us because they use our system in the schools. Um, certainly the, the young people who graduate and we give the, people who uh, come through these systems a full graduation. And many times we hired them so that they can help bring others who, let's say a gang member who gets pulled out of the gang. We, we can sometimes hire that gang member if they've done everything they're supposed to do to get the charges dismissed against them and they become circle keepers, they become case workers. And believe it or not, they are the most reliable source of information going back into the community because 
us adults, they look at us with some suspicion, but somebody who is their age, somebody who's gone through it, and they say, oh, you, you mean they dismissed the charges against you? Um, well, I'll give it a try. So it's, it's, a, it's a cooperative effort. And uh, maybe when we, when we have this again next year, sometimes when the coronavirus is over, maybe I can say there's no resistance at all. Everybody's welcoming us, but that's not the case right now. It's a, it's a convincing process that we have to go through. I just wanna um, um, agree with the judge um, that some of our most impactful um, um, uh, peacemakers are former respondents. Um, that's a very, very true statement. And that is part of the um, transformative nature of peacemaking and circles and restorative justice. So it is so good to hear those stories. Um, and as you've all mentioned, collaboration is the name of the game, more so with restorative justice than in even other alternative programs. Um, it's really important to get our partners together. And it's interesting that you said, Judge, you know, even one set of collaborations and partnerships in one area, it's gonna look different everywhere you go because your community is different everywhere you go. Um, so that was, that was really important to highlight, thank you. Okay, so shifting to the here and now, I'm curious to hear from you guys, has your restorative justice approaches and practices, have they changed since COVID? And if so, what does that look like now? How have you adapted to keep your programs um, functional and relevant and still connecting and engaging with people? Um, I'm gonna start, with you, Amanda. Sure, so yes, of course, <laughs> like the rest of our lives, we have definitely had to adapt our programming um, to meet this moment. Um, you know, we, as of March, everything that we've been doing in Red Hook um, or the bulk of our work in Red Hook has been virtual. And so I think everybody can probably agree that figuring out how to create meaningful connections <laughs> and have the same kind of impact um, when you're looking at a little square on a screen um, as opposed to sitting beside someone and passing a talking piece, um, that there are challenges with that. Um, you know, it's like the, the heart of this model is about connections and <laughs> is it, is easy to connect um, over Zoom or Google Meets or whatever platform you're using. Um, you know, for a lot of folks, it's not. Um, you know, there's also practical challenges of people just not having internet connection or technology access or, um, you know, not having a place that they consider private or safe when they're in, you know, their own home and they're trying to um, go through this process. So, I mean, I, I credit our team, you know, I, I really can't take this credit myself at all, but our peacemaking team was extremely nimble um, and able to develop whole new sets of protocols to make this work. Everything from, you know, doing electronic, um, uh, signing for consents and doing intakes and, you know, getting folks um, the training that they need and preparation they need in advance before they do sessions um, and finding ways to, to be connected virtually. And, and then a little bit in person. So, you know, we've been able to do, as I mentioned, some like a peacemaker meetup in person. So there's a little bit of that, but um, I think it, it's a huge challenge. Um, and I think that um, they, they were able to find new ways and creative ways of connecting. Um, but certainly, you know, you can't deny the fact that something is lost when you're not sitting there in person face to face. So, but you have to make the best of it. Um, and, you know, I'm proud of our team because they, they have managed to, to be extremely responsive. I'll, I'll add that one of the most common conflicts that we have been seeing um, types of cases we're getting is family conflicts. You not surprisingly, you know, there's been an uptick in domestic violence. There's been an uptick in all sorts of family conflicts that was brought on by quarantine. Um, and we have a good partnership with the juvenile department of probation 
And they started sending a lot of referrals, um, not necessarily where the young person was getting in, you know, getting arrested, um, but more that the probation officer could tell that there was a lot of strife in the home and that had been exacerbated by the pandemic. And so our peacemaking team has been you know, really working hard to try to work with the young people, work with their families, um, and try to kind of use this as an opportunity, like just for some healing, even if it's not a, a referral, we are getting some referrals from the court, but just opportunities to, to improve communications skills within families um, and address just the realities that the stress of the pandemic has caused. Thank you. Ron, I'm wondering if you can tackle this next. When you sit in a, in a, in a, in a live setting in a circle of people, you pass the talking piece. I like to um, make sure that my circles um, are a safe place for people to open up and go deep. And uh, sometimes in, uh, in, uh, with technology, you're not, uh, you're not able to do that. I like to look into a person's eyes and read their soul make sure that the um, get a feeling of contrition um, from the respondent and and look at the victim and make sure they're comfortable. I'm not above at all aborting aborting a, a circle session if I feel that the victim is uncomfortable or if the respondent is not telling the truth or not being forthright. So th those kinds of things are important to me. And I also like to look at the body movements and the expressions on the face of, um, of uh, people in the circle and judge the quality of the circle. I often work with a, with a co-circle keeper so that we can sort of feed off of each other. And, and one of the things that I emphasized was um, I look at people's, um, um, especially uh, victims and, and, and sometimes um, respondents, I look at marks on their body and maybe um, uh, razor scratches on their wrists. And this gives you an, an indication of the depth and the uh, level of, of their involvement. And I talked about the young lady that had a bruise on the side of her face. And at first I asked her about it and uh, she sort of blew me off. But then after the meeting, she asked me to come aside into my, into my office. And we talked for about another maybe hour and a half about the, the abuse that she was, um, involved in and she was afraid to go home and so forth. And so I contacted the police department in a particular neighborhood that she lived in. And we were able to resolve some, resolve some of her issues. So the issues that she had weren't even about the circle or what she was there for, but it was a part of her life and the quality of her life. Adele, uh, certainly we have had some similar problems Amanda and Ron uh, described. Um, I'll start first with um, the need for Zoom licenses themselves. We, we had, before the coronavirus hit, we had um, 12 uh, Zoom licenses for all of our judges to use. We now have 400 Zoom licenses. Wow. Each judge has a Zoom license to enable us to do our work. And then um, we, we had to take into consideration what um, Amanda and Ron said. Some of the people who we want to work with on Zoom don't have that capacity at home. So what we do there is we make a Zoom room available for them at, at our courthouses. A room where they can sit alone, where nobody's in there to interrupt them. They can say whatever they want to say. They know what they are saying is confidential. And we don't have to worry about the camera going off, you know, if they're trying to do it from home or um, whatever the, the problem is. That some, many of our uh, young people have younger people on Zoom in classrooms, so that we don't want them to be fighting over access to the computer. So um, we, we made um, changes in our courthouses to accommodate them, but it's all worth it. I mean, the results that come from this 
are so spectacular until it's well worth the extra effort. And if I had it my way, of course, I would rather have the one-on-one -on -one circle uh, atmosphere. Um, you, yeah, you can see the, the, the scars, you know, the gang signs, the, the gang colors, all of those kinds of things you can't necessarily see when you're trying to watch it on a computer. But I just, rather than us stopping while the coronavirus is going, going on, I think it's better to go ahead us make the adjustments that we have to make because we're saving lives all the time. Every day, a new life is saved and it's well worth the extra effort we have to embrace in order to do it safely. Thank you all for sharing that. I mean, this we are, we are in very difficult times um, as a nation, um, as our court systems, as people who are moving through them. Um, so I appreciate you guys sharing some of your solutions, of your strategies, and, and some of the challenges we're still working through um, as we try to deliver good programming um, that can be meaningful and have an impact in people's lives. So the next question I'd like to ask you is about, um, can restorative justice be a space for transformation, not just with individuals, but with communities? Um, is there a role for restorative justice in addressing things like racial and ethnic disparities in the justice system and for addressing racial tensions and creating racial healing in community? So I'd like to start this question with you, Ron. Well, let me just tell you um, a quick story. Um, there's a case that some people consider sort of put our case on the map. And um, um, being that we do sign um, letters of confidentiality, there's not a lot I can say. There are some things that I can't say about the case, but it received so much publicity in Milwaukee and it was, I mean, in Madison, and it was on the news. There are some things that I can talk about. But it was a young lady who was at a mall. They got into an argument with a, um, uh, with the, um, um, with the mall um, police. And when the police showed up, it became very racial. Um, she thought that they were attacking her because of because she was black. She was about five five, maybe 110 pounds, and the police officer first engaged her and grabbed her, and she was homeless, and uh, she had a burrito in her hand. And you know, sometimes when you're young and you're homeless, uh, food acquisition and ownership is very very important. And and the burrito got knocked out of her hand. Make a long story short, but um, she was um, they um, treated her pretty rough. She was, she was tased and she was shot and um, in defiance, she spit on the police officer and, and they put the spit hood, um, hood on her and so forth. So when the DA got the case, he referred the case to the CRC, the Community Restorative Court. So the black community was very upset. The white community was upset. And of course, the law enforcement community was up against the wall as well. This case took us a year. Most cases take, takes about, um, maybe one or two um, circles. This case lasted for about a year. We engaged the district attorney, we engaged the police union, um, community leaders. It was a very intense and sensitive case. And one of the things in the repair harm agreement, well, at, at first the police wanted her punished, but after we did circle after circle and they began to see each other as human beings, as opposed to perpetrators and, and um, and uh, police officers, they began to see each other as human beings. And um, the police changed. I saw the police actually change. That's why I talk about we can, we can live through paradigms and, um, and, and change and restorative justice allows people to get to know each other. When victims and respondents are, are in a circle together, they can sometimes see each other as human beings. And one of the things in her repair harm agreement that we did a police academy, a mini academy, and she was able to be a part of seeing how police make decisions and interactions and so forth. And we had lunch one day and um, <clears throat> um, she was um, sitting eating lunch and, and some, somewhere during the lunch, she decided to pick up her tray and go over to the table with the two police officers who roughed her up and, and roughed her up is a, is a very um, um, light way of saying that she was, um, she was abused. 
and she sat down and she had lunch with them. So this showed us, then I knew we had won because it was on our own volition that she went over and sat down with the police officers and I knew that we had made quantum leaps. Um, there have been many, many cases around the country where when things were handled traditionally, that didn't happen. But the restorative process allowed us to bridge the racial gap. And um, as, as things turned out, um, when the circle system was, was over, they actually hugged each other. And um, it was a very powerful lesson in racial dynamics and the justice system. That was a powerful story. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Chief Judge, do you have any thoughts you'd want to add? Yes, I, I will say um, one of the things that we decided to do because of the kinds of issues going on across the country, um, I wanted our, our judges to be prepared for a new approach. And so I, I required that all of our judges have uh, mandatorily implicit bias training. And I wish I could say that our judges immediately said, oh, great. Th th some of them thought, oh, Evans thinks that I'm a biased person. And, and they, 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 some of them came readily, others didn't want to come at all. They thought I was saying that, that they could not be fair. But once they had the imp implicit bias training, they saw, oh, everybody has biases. The idea is to put the biases aside before you make your decision so that there's no bias in the decision that you make. And so uh, that was just the start of it. But in our system here, we still have great um, chasms between the various races and various ethnic groups, the various religious groups. Uh, certainly we have, I talked a little bit about the gang entitlements and entanglements that we have here in, in Cook County. So uh, I think that this system where we are teaching people how to solve a problem without revenge uh, and without thinking that they have to treat somebody else like they thought they were treated. And as an example here, it was typically the case that uh, uh, hypothetically, uh, let's say somebody, Mr. X had a, had a sister who was hurt by Mr. Y. Then Mr. X would be told, hey, you're a, you're a sissy or you're, you're something less than a man if you don't go back and do the same thing to Mr. Y's sister or to somebody in Mr. Y's family. And, and it was um, revenge and, and too much of that still goes on right here in Cook County. But we have to show them that, hey, um, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth ends up with everybody blind. No, nobody benefits from that. And so this system of restorative justice finds a way to build the kind of relationship that Ron just described, even though it seemed impossible to begin with, without revenge and without some kind of a payback uh, requirement. And uh, people can still keep their head up without doing to somebody else what was done to them. So I, I think it is a good way to do it. Uh, it may not be the answer for everybody, but in the cases that we take the time to work on, I've seen it work. Thank you so much, Chief Judge. Amanda, do you have any thoughts you wanna add? Yeah, well, I, I would echo a lot of what the Chief Judge just said and also what, what Ron shared. And, you know, if you look at the models of truth and reconciliation, you know, models that have been employed in other parts of the world, you know, they're using restorative justice principles. If you look at, um, the models that have been used um, in different parts of the country um, in the context of police reconciliation um, in a handful of cities in Pittsburgh and Stockton, um, Minneapolis and a handful of other cities um, across the country, what, what they're using are restorative practices to address these precisely these kinds of issues, systemic harm, um, you know, racial healing, um, 
relationships between police and community um, that have been strained, you know, for decades. And so I think there's tremendous potential um, for restorative processes to, to play a role in this space. So in Red Hook, we've used circles to build a sense of community between police and young people through a program that we created called Bridging the Gap. And it's not centered around a specific incident or a specific harm between you know, uh, this officer and this young person, but it's about creating a space to talk about these broader issues, um, a space where people can share their honest truths, where a young person can say, this is why I don't trust police. I wanna tell you, about the interactions that I've had with law enforcement. Um, and also for the young people to hear from the officers what it's like every day when they go on patrol and they're not sure what they're going to find and they're not sure whether they're gonna get home safe, right? Um, and so for, for them to be able to share those honest perspectives. Um, and, I can't say that that's transformed the relationship, you know, of every young person in our community with the police, right? Um, however, I think that it is important and it's, it's a first step and a really important first step in just creating a space to have honest conversations and, you know, restorative practices allow for that, to have conversations that wouldn't otherwise be had. And also a space that can feel safe for everyone, um, you know, for people to be able to share their truth um, and they're on an even playing field. Um, and that's not something that a lot of young people will typically feel if they're sitting in a room um, full of officers. Um, and it also creates a space where people are willing to get uncomfortable. They're willing to sit with that discomfort to work through those difficult conversations. So I do think that, you know, we certainly have a long way to go, but, you know, in my mind, there's no question that restorative practices are a part of this solution. Thank you, everyone. Um, I feel like I could have a whole nother hour of conversation with the three of you. There are so many interesting things you brought up that we could delve much deeper into. Um, things like community safety, things like, or the safety of individuals in circles or out of circles, things like um, uh, delving deeper into some of those partnerships with law enforcement, um, things like being transformative systemically. Um, and unfortunately, I think those are gonna have to be conversations for another day. Um, but I think there is foreshadowing and forecasting there as to where the future of restorative justice can go in your programs and in our justice system as a whole. So thank you all so much for taking time to have this conversation. I hope we have another opportunity to do it. It has been fascinating. It has been interesting. And thank you so much. So thank you to everyone in the audience for joining our restorative justice panel. We are now entering the phase where we're gonna go into a live Q&A chat. Um, we only have a few minutes. So we've decided that we are gonna spend the remainder of our time talking about um, following up on the conversation that we ended the restorative justice panel with because it's a big conversation. It's an important conversation and we want to spend some time going into it a little bit more and um, leaving everyone in the audience with a lot of ideas and thoughts and concepts to chew on. Um, so the question or the topic that we're going to pose for the remainder of our time is we're going to talk about um, if and how restorative justice can be used to create a space for healing and conversation between community and law enforcement? Um, can restorative justice be a vehicle for bringing everyone together and to have a conversation about um, harm and hurt and a history of mistrust um, and creating a space to humanize perspectives um, and to create an opportunity for healing? So I'm going to start the conversation um, with Judge Evans, I'm going to ask if you can talk about have you had an opportunity to try to create this space um, and have you had any challenges working through it? Thank you very much, Adele. Uh, I can certainly tell you that there is great room for opportunity for
for that kind of uh, uh, bridging of the gap between the community and uh, law enforcement here in Cook County. We have about 13,000 police officers and we have had some horrible problems here in Chicago and in Cook County involving law enforcement and the community. Frequently with somebody from the community calling for help from law enforcement and uh, law enforcement, uh, instead of solving the problem, uh, causing the problem to get worse. So we have great room for improvement. Um, we have a new superintendent and a new mayor in the city of Chicago. And uh, we believe that that new superintendent has received some training about restorative justice. And I don't think it will be a foreign concept to him, but trying to make certain that 13,000 of his uh, police officers who have not all had the training centered around restorative justice uh, will be a real challenge. I think he's up for the challenge. I know we're willing to work with him, but we have not yet seen uh, uh, a broad-based participation in terms of law enforcement, except locally, the local police commanders in Inglewood and uh, Avondale and also in North Lawndale, they are on board. So we have seen at a local level where the restorative justice courts do exist, we've seen broad-based uh, participation by the local police department and their personnel, but we have not yet seen the broad-based commitment and participation across all of the boundaries here in the city of Chicago. Thanks, Judge Evans. Amanda, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, a couple of things. I, I mean, I spoke a little bit about this earlier in the panel. Um, I think we've created some spaces for this in Red Hook, you know, our work with peacemaking and our bridging the gap program that holds circles between police and youth. Um, but I think there's space to do so much more and it's something we definitely would love to see. And I think one of the biggest challenges is just that you really need buy-in from the top of any law enforcement agency to do something like this because for those conversations to be meaningful, for them to work, they have to be honest. And so the messaging really has to be that like, police can go there. And I think the you know typical um, law enforcement officer isn't going to embrace that or be willing to go there and have make certain admissions or have those tough conversations unless it's clear there's been an investment and a message from the top that this is something that they're they're doing and prioritizing. And the other thing I think is, is we're thinking about is, is that we have an opportunity to really engage with police around building out alternatives to traditional law enforcement. And in this national conversation that's been happening around um, defunding the police and investing in alternatives, I think you know what we're really saying is we wanna reallocate resources to create these alternative responses to problems in our community. But I think all too often, people interpret that as meaning police are the adversary in that conversation. I think it's precisely the opposite because what we can do as community courts is actually leverage our relationships with police, work with them to identify where they can step back and do less and then help us shift resources to other community-based alternatives. And, and so I think police are more than happy to have other tools and alternatives at their disposal so that they can focus their attention on the problems they really do need to address when it comes to public safety. So our role as community courts is that we can offer and promote and maybe make connections and, and offer these real alternatives so that um, police can really invest the resources in the, um, the true threats to public safety. Ron, I'm hoping you can chime in. I know you guys are doing a lot of great work over there. Yes, uh, we had, uh, I just tell a quick story. Um, my mentor for restorative justice, Professor Janine Gesky, always said, just tell a story and that'll illuminate uh, the picture. Um, we had a case of uh, actually a diversity professor at UW who was accosted by two drunk young white boys and they called him the N-word. And when they got out of the car and approached him, he decked one of them, knocked him out. So when the police came, um, they told the police that this black guy um, attacked them. And so two or three police officers came over to his house. And at first they were a little aggressive with him. And then they realized that he was indeed the victim. He was there with his wife and his children. And he told his story. And um, we did the circle that lasted a, a few months. And um, 
It was a very intense circle. It was full of racial issues. It was it was almost right off the front pages of the race issue in America. And when it was all over, the young white guy apologized profusely. The um, victim laid out the repair harm agreement, which was very complicated and, and comprehensive. And then a couple of days later, the mayor of the city of Milwaukee, as well as the chief of police, contacted this young man and apologized to him. Not only did they apologize to him, but they offered him a position on the Fire and Police Commission. So that, in, that racial incident, yes, indeed, sort of changed the way that policing is done in the city of Madison, because by him being on the Fire and Police Commission, his voice will be heard for years to come. Thank you so much, Ron. That was a really powerful story. Um, and that is the heart of restorative justice is sharing our powerful stories. So I appreciate each of you uh, making time to be on our panel and um, join us here to answer questions. I wish we had more time. I know I've said this before and I'll keep saying it. Um, there's so much more to be said, um, but I'm grateful for all the time you guys have given. So thank you everyone. Thank you to the people who joined us today. Um, and I guess we'll chat and circle again another time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.